Hey everybody, I hope you all had a nice weekend. Um, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and that's why I'm doing this Instagram Live. I've gotten so many ans uh, questions for you all to ask our experts. Uh, ex expert, I'm gonna be talking to Dr. Ann Partridge. And really, let's see if I can get this request in. Uh, Dr. Partridge is at Dana-Farber. She is a medical oncologist and clinical researcher. She's focused on improving the care and outcomes of patients with breast cancer, particularly young patients with breast cancer. So I wanted to really kind of find out what was going on with younger women. And um, hi, everybody. Um, and I think it's really important for us to understand what's going on with women under the age of 50 and in fact, under the age of 40. So yes, Dana-Farber is a great place. So let's see if I can get Dr. Partridge here. Hello, Dr. Partridge. How are you? I'm great. Please call me Ann. Okay, Ann. Thank you so much. You know, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month and I wanted to, I might just you all, can you do the questions in the question section because it covers Anne's face and I think it's maybe a little distracting for folks. But Anne, um, you know, I thought this was a good way, by the way, I'm wearing my pink for breast cancer awareness. Thank you. I and, could have done you know, it early in the month though. <laughs> Just started. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we wanted to kick things off. We're going to be covering a lot of issues surrounding breast cancer in our newsletter, Wake Up Call. You know, everything from dense breasts, which I've been obsessed with, with aroma uh, and aromatase inhibitors, which are, uh, you know, estrogen suppressing drugs that I have to take because of my own breast cancer diagnosis. But I, I you know, the one thing I was concerned about is I feel like I've been meeting so many younger women who have breast cancer. I was shopping this summer at a store and two different women, I believe one was 32 and one was 38, told me that they had been diagnosed with breast cancer. So I wanted to have this conversation to understand what was going on with women being diagnosed at a younger age. And um, I mean, I guess we got a lot of questions from social, but I, I thought I'd just ask you right off the bat, Anne, what is going on? So Katie, thank you for covering this. Um, you know, no young woman should be told she's too young to have breast cancer because as you noted, young women can and do get breast cancer. Fortunately, it's still fairly uncommon. It's only going to occur in about one in 2000 women under 30 and about one in 250 women under 40, but that's not nothing, right? Right. That's still a lot of women to think about a whole population. And, you know, we don't really know exactly what's going on for why it's increasing. I used to think it was just because people talk to me about it, so the numbers were high. Right. One thing is that the population of women in that age group is actually going up in our country. So there are more young women than there used to be, just total. Mm -hmm. But very recently, in the last decade, we've learned, and only about a, uh, six months ago, there was a publication that showed that from the 2010s to the 2019s, there was a, a clear increase in what we call young onset breast cancer, among other young onset cancers. Right, of course, colon cancer is also experiencing the same thing with a dramatic rise in people under the age of 50. And I've done a lot of advocacy about colon cancer as well, but we're gonna talk about that another time since this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So I guess the question is, you know, I hear this and I wonder what is going on and are there environmental factors and are there things like microplastics? Are there things like forever chemicals? Are there insecticides? Are there things in our environment? Because, you know, I know the explanation for young onset of cancers for a long time, at least, what I was told by experts, uh, obesity, right, uh, was the number one thing and lifestyle and some of these so-called so social determinants of health, which obviously is a whole different category. But I'm just wondering, are there people studying some of these other risk factors or some of these other factors that may be 
more environmental in nature? So the good, good news is there are people studying it. The bad news is we haven't found, or maybe it's good news, we haven't really found a smoking gun in terms of an external environment reason why we're seeing the, the increases in these young onset cancers. Speaking about breast cancer, I think so far the societal trends later years of having, you know, some of them are good, waiting to have your babies. That's not a bad thing for most women if that's the right thing for them. But we know that having babies early actually decreases risk of breast cancer over a lifetime, whereas having a baby a little bit later can, especially early on, increase a risk of breast cancer. Things like that that are happening societally may be driving part of it. Some of it's clearly the body kind of energy balance things, exercise, diet, obesity. But then I look at my skinny patients in my clinic and say, okay, that can't explain it all. <laughs> right, right. Well, can you explain briefly why having children later may actually increase your risk of breast cancer? Because I tried to read about that and I couldn't quite understand it. Well, join the club. It's complicated, I'll tell you that. But what the basics of it is that the more a woman cycles in her lifetime, the higher the risk of lifetime breast cancer. So if you start your periods earlier in life and you get your periods later, you know, you keep having it till later, that person's at higher risk for both of those reasons. Having a baby, two things happen, and we don't completely understand it, but having a baby early over the lifetime is protective. But remember that most women, if they're going to get breast cancer, get it in the postmenopausal or over 50-ish age. And it is protective, especially if you do it under the age of 30. But in the short term, right after a baby, there's actually a blip in terms of increased risk for the first year out even several years. So it's very complicated. And as women age, if they're having a baby at a later age, they're hitting that kind of starting to get breast cancer age demographic and, or you know, more frequently, late 30s, 40s, and they're getting that bump increase from the risk of just having had a pregnancy. And what about being on the birth control pill? Now, I could be, I want you to please correct me, and I. this is the danger of having a little bit of knowledge, but... I remember reading that nuns, because they never went on birth control, had a higher rate of breast cancer. Now, I could be dreaming that, but I had a, my husband, my late husband had a relative who was a nun, an incredible woman, and she passed away from breast cancer. And I remember sort of hearing that being on the pill can actually help prevent breast cancer. Am I crazy? <laughs> so not crazy, but you, the point of the, the nuns is that they usually don't become pregnant. Right. <laughs> they don't right. get any of those long-term protective things and they're cycling therefore for longer. Plus um, breastfeeding actually is also lifetime protective. And oh, so interesting. If you don't have a pregnancy, obviously you don't breastfeed. And but so they don't get the some, but so the pill Sorry to interrupt. No, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the birth control pill. So just getting back to the pill, the pill is actually protective for ovarian cancer, interestingly, and it slightly increases the risk of breast cancer, which is so relatively low in most young women that most women say, you know, what's worse? A tiny increased risk in a young person, societally or uh, uh, population-wise, versus the risk of an unwanted pregnancy. And we also think that a lot of the risk was due to higher dose formulations that were from yesteryear, and that the majority of our kind of low dose oral contraceptives or other forms of um, hormonal contraception are so much lower now that we don't think they have a huge impact. Got it. And you know, now that you mentioned it, Anne, I think it was the fact that they have their periods constantly and they never take a break where they have that nine or 10 month gestation period where they're pregnant. So they have more periods than women who have children. I think that was probably the situation with nuns. Yeah, and I th think the other thing about a pregnancy and, and particularly lactation, but even without a pregnancy, even though I just said there's that short term risk that bumps up when things are going on is the way I think about it. 
the breast actually settles down after a pregnancy to a longer term state of lower risk. And that's the right. way I think of it. Nuns never get that. Well, let's talk, of, let me ask you some questions because I think what's frustrating, if there has been an increased risk of women under 50 and even under 40 being diagnosed with breast cancer, the guidelines have not changed. The recommendation is to get your first screening mammogram at 40, correct? And even the recommendation is every two years. Most people I know get mammograms every year. And we can talk about dense breasts in a moment because that's my new kind of big campaign to make women aware of if, if, you know, understand if they have dense breasts or not and how mammography may not be sufficient. But getting back to the guidelines, what are younger women supposed to do? Uh, because I also know that many of them are not testing positive for the BRCA gene for BRCA1 or 2, which increases your uh, your risk of breast cancer really significantly, right? 80% or very, something, Anne? Exactly, very 50 to 80%. So, so first, I think you, got, you touched on a really important point. First, you want to know your own, as best one can, your own family history. Not everybody can know their family history, but if you have a strong family history, that's a first degree relative with breast cancer, particularly at a young age, or maybe on your father's side, an aunt or a mother who had breast cancer or other patterns of cancers, you wanna to talk to your doctor about it and you wanna think about getting genetic testing, which is what you were alluding to, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 and other genetic tests that you can do these days because it's not just BRCA1 and BRCA2, there are other syndromes that we can have. In fact, Anne, I understand that there's something like 36, like the panel has increased quite dramatically for genetic mutations that may put you at a higher risk of breast cancer. There's something like 36. Am I, am I remembering there that about, right? There, well, there are, there are even more than that, but there are about eight or nine that we routinely test and use clinically unless we see a weird pattern for breast cancer. Um, and those ones are on our standard panels, but you're absolutely right. The panels can go on and on and you can find, you have to be careful not to over-interpret them because sometimes they're not they're necessarily the reason the person got a cancer. And there's plenty of people who have some of those lower penetrant genes, that's what we call it. They're not as likely to cause a cancer. Whereas you, you find it, you don't want people necessarily doing something very risk reducing like a bilateral mastectomy when the risks aren't quite as high. So the BRCA1 and BRCA2 and some of the other rare genes really increase the risk like that, you know, 50 to 80% risk of breast and then of course ovarian cancer. Those are the ones you want to know about. So if a woman is adopted, doesn't know her family history and or has a strong or strongish family history, I always encourage them to talk to their doctor and think about genetic testing. What do they do if they're negative or don't have that? I mean, I think that's the really hard question for an individual. And there is no good screening for under 40 unless you're high risk and then we do MRIs, right? Or we do contrast enhanced mammography, which is a new kid on the block, which hopefully will help with some of these things. But nobody's doing it under 40 unless you have a strong you know, predisposition. And so what I typically recommend right now is just know your own breast health. Know the topography of your breast. If something feels different, if there's a lump, a bump, discharge, change anything under the arm bring it to your doctor's attention and don't take a oh it's nothing you can hear maybe it's probably nothing but follow up make sure it goes away with a menstrual cycle if it doesn't then you might merit an ultrasound or some other evaluation and that's particularly important so you're talking about doing are you talking about doing breast self-examinations so, sort of so, every so month breast self-exam was studied it was actually studied in asia compared to doing nothing in women. And they compared a routine self breast exam monthly to nothing in factory workers in Asia. And what they found was that the breast self exam didn't improve any outcome. They found more cancers, but no improvement in how these women were doing in the long run. And so the mantra became, okay, throw away the shower cards, don't examine your breasts. And we said, that's silly. Most of the people who come in with breast cancer in our young women's groups, they felt it themselves and they had to advocate to have someone you know, work it up. And so I think the, the middle sane ground is to say, know what your breasts feel like, work with your doctor on you know, what's the best thing for you, know the topography, know if you have a new rash, 
any pain that's not going away or changes that are getting worse over time, especially, and don't wait too long and get in and get some attention. I, from what I've read, the num most of the women who are under 50 and 40 uh, who are being diagnosed or under 50 and under 40 with breast cancer do not have a genetic mutation. They, you know, and I always think, well, is that because this particular, there are a lot of mutations that have still not been discovered. So, um, but they're what, call, what are called sort of sporadic cases where it's just completely out of the blue, no family history, no BRCA, no other mutation, and suddenly they're diagnosed with breast cancer. So what you're saying is particularly important, but also frustrating that there is no better test for women if in fact the numbers are going up. What are they supposed to do if they're not eligible for a mammogram? No, I think you're exactly right. And I, you know, mammograms, as you know, aren't great in our young women. So they might, they could get them, we could get them on them all, but it's not clear that it would help them, right? Because, Why is that? Because the breasts are more dense and mammograms really only work in less dense breasts. Um, they work okay in dense breasts, but not as well as we would like. And young women, particularly if they're cycling, uh, you know, having babies or lactating or things like that, they have even more dense breasts even than the women who are in their 40s and we're dealing with the should be, you get them an MRI or an ultrasound or some other imaging to, you know, further evaluate after the dense breast. So the younger one is on average, the more dense the breasts are, the breast tissue. Uh, so it's, you're right, it's a very, very tricky thing. And I do hope, and I am optimistic, and our group's even looking into this, that it, we may ultimately, for these young women who don't have a clear hereditary predisposition, one gene, there's something called polygenic risk scores, patterns of genes, right? It might be that there is a pattern that, of genes that each one alone isn't something that's very clearly going to cause breast cancer, but some combination for especially for these young onset situations. So that's what our group and others are collaborating to try and figure out. And there's a lot of work going on trying to understand that, what's going on in the people who don't have a clear hereditary predisposition. But right now that's just being studied. If somebody watching this was 34 years old and wanted to get genetic testing, any kind of suspicious pattern would not emerge at this point in time. We're not doing that routinely as part of our genetic testing. Someone That's is asking, I'm 31 with a history of breast cancer on both sides of my family, my mom, my aunt, and my grandmother. What should I be talking to my doctor about right now? Can I ask to do a breast density test? Uh, we got a lot of questions along those lines. Is it is that helpful or is that not particularly telling since there's no follow-up to what that person might get. Although this history of breast cancer sounds like they should be tested for the BRCA yeah. gene, right? So that's, and I'm so happy for that question. So that person should absolutely talk to their doctor about whether or not they have a genetic predisposition and get genetic testing. Counseling is usually what we recommend first uh, mm -hmm. because the counselors can put a person's family history, their personal history into these risk calculators to understand in a little bit, a lot more discriminating way what might be their true risk. And then they typically will test someone who has a decently strong family history. Fortunately, the testing has gotten a lot cheaper, still not completely cheap, but it's a lot cheaper than it was a decade ago. So we've opened it up much more, fortunately, even for people, you know, and you have to be careful because even if you test negative, as you said, you can still get breast cancer. And you right. know, most of the people I know who have breast cancer don't have a genetic predisposition that we can measure yet. And so you have to be, you can't assume you won't get it even if you test negative or that, you know, your that your mother or your aunt has it. But that's a good place to start. The issue about testing, you know, there's no such thing as a kind of breast density test. We do the tests to find breast cancer for screening, mamm mammograms, ultrasounds, MRIs, contrast enhanced CTs or mammograms, and there are other tests as well. And you can measure breast density on those right. tests. Right. And we right. over but you have to have the test to determine right. density. Right, but you do find out, particularly from a mammogram when you start doing them, whether you have, and usually they grade them in three different ways, you know, extremely dense, moderately dense, or whatever your radiologists use, and then, you know, scattered density, or they don't even say anything, which means it's probably not too dense. You know, we, 
we, uh, I, I have dense breasts and I always have gotten a breast ultrasound in addition to the mammogram because they say it's like trying to find a white bunny rabbit or a white snowball against a backdrop of snow because the density of the breasts makes your breasts look white in, in, in a mammogram. So I guess the question too is why, um, why aren't, isn't this routine when you, are told you have dense breasts, which by the way is changing in 2024 because the FDA has changed its policy about notification. It was very different in every state. In some states, there was no requirement. In other states, they ex kind of told you but didn't explain right. what that meant. So now universally people, as I'm sure you know, Anne, starting in 2024 are gonna be told if they have dense breasts. And 43% of women over the age of 40 have dense breasts. And we had an article by a radiologist that said something like 263,000 cases of breast cancer were missed in 2021 because of dense breasts. And I, you know, and, and he did a whole study on this. So it's a big problem. This is a long-winded way of asking, why don't they just do it routinely? And why can't insurance pay for it? Well, I I, I absolutely think that these are tests that should be done in the right indication. One of the problems is, A, the breast density thing was a little ahead of its time early on, and I'm glad that it's going to be more routinized, obviously, because of the law. But historically, when we found a woman with dense breasts, we didn't really know what to do. So you can add on another test but you don't actually know that you're gonna help her with that test. And so we had to wait to, for the data to catch up with that because, you know, A, MRIs, if we do, if we do MRIs on that 43% of women with dense breasts, there's not enough MRI machines in most cities and states, right, to do that. And so we have to think about the implications of, and, and if you don't have a, if you don't have studies that show that getting that MRI in that kind of patient is going to make them live longer or feel better, then we don't necessarily want to push something when we're not sure that it's going to help people. I think it is moving in that direction. And as I alluded to, there are newer tests that we can use like ultrasounds, which are notoriously user dependent and good in some people's hands and not great in others. And then the other one. Right. And, that, and also, and don't they have, sorry, don't they have automated automated ones that aren't as good as the ones that are being conducted by an experienced yeah, I, professional. I, you know, it's not my area of expertise. I just know that it generally is, you have, it's hit or miss, you mm -hmm. know, and, and that's where we get a little anxious about that and they're hard to reproduce. I think things like a contrast enhanced mammogram, which is actually coming into vogue in a lot of centers and CTs, which are faster, you can do them faster will make a big difference too. So we're now doing, is it, is we're doing tomogram, which is more views, but now with the contrast enhancement of some of our images, it can help kind of get that snowball, uh, the bunny in the snow be more able to be seen if someone's unfortunate enough to have a bunny in there. A bunny sounds too nice for a cancer. We gotta come up with a better analogy for that. Yeah, and, and I also know that they're doing clinical trials for something called fast MRIs. Right across the country that are much more truncated. Have you heard about that, Anne? Yeah, yep, that, that and CT scans, right? Oh. Quickies that allow you to kind of get in and get out, kind of like a mammogram, hopefully not squish you quite as much too, so it might even be more comfortable for women. Um, gosh, we got a lot of other questions. Let's talk about um, prevention. I know that there are a lot of people who are worried about this, uh, given the numbers increasing. What are the best things women can do in terms of preventing this from happening? So what we, what we think from getting breast cancer, you know, for young women, really hard. So we recommend kind of over a lifetime, big things that are associated with increased risk are weight gain after age 18, drinking more rather than less alcohol. We always argue about where the cutoffs are, especially all the oncologists who like to have their glass of wine. Um, somewhere between four to seven drinks per week should be the max for a woman if they choose to drink. Um, and then, so so exercise also is associated with doing better and not getting breast cancer. Um, those are three of the biggest things that one can control. 
recently smoking has been also associated with breast cancer. We never think of that as a smoking related cancer, but the most so recent data suggested cancer. Like, yeah. So many yeah. cancers, I think, increase with smoking, right? Yep, yep. But even breast cancer. So another good reason to quit smoking. But there's 10 more reasons before that to quit smoking. Someone asked some about the, these new scans called Pernuvo that I guess, you know, my friend Maria Menounos got one and it found her pancreatic cancer at a very early stage. Are those good for women who may not be eligible for mammograms? So great question. Right now, all of the early detection scans, and even we're, we're even testing whether or not we can do a blood draw and find CT DNA. So, so circulating tumor DNA in the blood, blood biopsies, we call that, to, to detect cancers early, early cancer detection through the blood. Same thing with the images. None of that is really ready for kind of population-based prime time. A lot of people are doing it and in very high risk groups, um, certainly imaging is, is worthwhile, especially if you have a very high risk of pancreatic cancer or genetic predisposition. Um, but when it comes to the vast majority of people, it's not so clear that it's going to be worth it. And there's, you have to be careful with any scan because you can pick up things that are nothing, right. make false people crazy. Positive. Well, lots of false positives make people crazy emotionally and do interventions to test that could hurt them physically. Um, so knowledge is power for sure. So I'm not anti-looking in some settings, but, but to say to a whole population, we've got to look at this. We've got, you want to have enough data to say it's worth all of the inconvenience, the costs, and the potential physical and emotional risks to individual patients. Is genetic testing covered by insurance? So I do believe in the country that is hit or miss. Um, but at least I'm, I'm in Massachusetts, so I'm pretty lucky. It does seem that most people are covered. Um, Someone just said, we need more research on inflammatory breast cancer, which affects such, uh, affects such young women. I don't even know what inflammatory breast cancer is, I'm embarrassed to say. What is that? Don't be embarrassed. That's a, it's a rare form of breast cancer. Not, well, it's about 5% of breast cancer is diagnosed. And it's a clinical and pathologic diagnosis. So it's a situation where a woman presents typically with a rash, redness, fullness, swelling in her breast, um, and usually not just a lump. And if you biopsy the tissue, it's not just in the breast, you know, in the inside the breast, it's often in the skin and causes swelling in the skin itself, kind of like an orange skin. So it's, it's that's kind of the classic look of it. Um, and it, it used to be something when a person, and I'll be honest with you, it used to be something when a person did well, we'd say, oh, it wasn't inflammatory breast cancer. But now that we have multidisciplinary care and all of the things that we know, people do much, much better. So yes, it needs more research. Yes, it can be a stage three disease, right? By definition, instead of stage one or two, which is what the majority of breast cancer are, it's stage three but our tools to help treat women who are dealing with that are much, much better and the outcomes are dramatically better than they used to be. And there's a lot of work going on specifically for inflammatory breast cancer, including at my place at Dana-Farber, where we have a program dedicated to inflammatory breast cancer. You might've said this, I'm trying to like listen, you know, read the questions and listen to you. Did you say specifically in how much alcohol <laughs> you could safely drink a day? You didn't react, so I'm wondering if you're a drinker. Don't answer that. Um, so, so safely, you know, it, there's a dose response curve in terms of risk. The more one drinks, the higher the risk. And yet, you know, there's the does red wine help your heart? Well, that's Rest kind of getting the ball and all that. Yeah, I mean, and you also have to live your life. I get into my car every day, and I could get in a car accident, but I still choose to drive, right? And people like alcohol, but obviously. For alcohol and breast cancer, the more one drinks, the higher the risk. So most of us would recommend no more than a glass a day on average. And yes, you can stack it on the weekends if you choose to drink. Um, yeah. For men, they're allowed to have two glasses because their livers process it better and they're usually bigger. But women, about a glass a day. And I always, you know, it's a glass, not a goblet, right? So it's about six ounces uh, of alcohol, you know, wine or the equivalent of some other alcohol. Yeah, luckily I am not a big drinker. Uh, I drink pretty rarely 
and I, you know, so, but this is really important for people to know, because I, I think, you know, there are people who drink two or three glasses of wine uh, a night, and that's probably not a great idea. And what about diet? I mean, I would imagine a diet that is low in, in red meat and high in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and all the things that are really good for you in general. But you tell me, I'm just making yeah, so that assumption. Good for you in general, but, but not quite the same links as we have in colon cancer, which I know you're so familiar with. And what we think in breast cancer, we haven't, we've looked into a lot of things. Chicken, is it better, is it worse? Is red meat bad or good for the actual breast cancer risks? And what we've found over and over again is it's not one thing necessarily when you really try and control for things, it's more about energy balance. And of course, what helps a person be more in energy balance? Eating whole grains, lots of fruits and vegetables, and getting plenty of exercise and staying slim, right? Because that's by definition, then you're in energy balance. And so I think so far though, not one food has been found to be the culprit, except a little bit of alcohol. People say, should I avoid sugar? Well, you know, if you eat a lot of sugar, you're gonna gain weight and you're gonna be hungry and you're gonna have, you know, your metabolism's gonna be off. And we know that the metabolic syndrome can make people gain weight, and it can also be associated with all of these solid tumors, including breast and colorectal cancer. And so trying to avoid that, avoid diabetes, that's a good thing for your heart and for everything else in your life. So, so I think all of these good things go together, but not just for breast cancer. For breast cancer, it seems to be energy balance is what you want to try to achieve and specifically, you, and those help you achieve that. And when you say energy balance when it comes to exercise i mean you know is there any kind of guidance you can give us in terms of ideally how much exercise you know i hear everything from walking is fine then i hear you have to increase your heart rate and you know cardiovascular exercise is important so can you give us sort of the latest science on how much we should be exercising Sure. There, it does appear that there is, you don't have to be a marathoner and you don't have to be a sprinter, but you do want to get cardiovascular and get your heart rate up. So brisk walking is where you want to go, not sauntering. And you want to try to get, and your, your average woman should try to get 150 minutes of cardiovascular exercise a week. And it can be walking, but again, not just like sauntering and talking to your neighbor with the dog, but picking up, you know, it's good to do that too but picking up the pace and, and that's 150 minutes, which of course is, you know, three 50 minute sessions or five 30 minute sessions or however you want to divide it. And then we also recommend that people get some weight bearing exercise, depending on what they're doing and, you know, lifting and stretching. And that's good for your core and good for your bone health. Because we know that, you know, even in breast cancer survivors or women who don't get breast cancer, for many women, they're also at risk for fractures and they're also at risk for cardiovascular disease. And, you know, exercise is good for that, right? The cardiovascular exercise, and then the stretching and the weight bearing exercise, but, you know, lifting small weights, you don't need to be pumping iron. You can do that if you want, but that's also associated with prevention of osteoporosis, right. or, you know, bone thinning. Of course, it's a major killer of American women too. I've been very conscious of that because I'm on, I'm, we're, we're not gonna really cover this today because I'm doing a whole other thing about aromatase inhibitors, but I'm on an aromatase inhibitor and honestly, I really don't like it. It makes my joints hurt, it makes my muscles hurt, but I am very conscious about my bones and weight bearing can mean, you know, doing things like yoga or leaning on your your own weight or push up exactly. or anything that it's not, you know, I think people hear weight bearing and they don't quite understand what that means, but it's just, I can't, you, your body can be your weight oh, too. Yeah, and I always joke that mine is, especially when, <laughs> especially as I've gotten older. Um, but it's, you know, I think you're absolutely right. And and you, you need to know that even just doing, you know, walking is weight bearing technically. Um, and But doing yoga and all of those things can be good both for your body and for the stretches and for the musculoskeletal complaints of that, you know, breast cancer survivors live with. Uh, incidentally, acupuncture can be super helpful really? for those. And it's studied in a randomized trial, but you'll talk to somebody else about that. Well, no, it is I mean, 
Yeah. I'd love to talk to you about it because I wonder, I mean, I feel like there isn't much help for women who are on aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen and kind of mitigating and handling the side effects of some of those. I think, honestly, I don't, I don't think those women, women get as much support as they need. I know that you're working with survivorship and you're working with young women in particular, but I think your average oncologist doesn't kind of appreciate how, how honestly, how shitty people feel on these aromatase inhibitors. I, I hear you. And I think we, we try very hard, at least I can speak for myself and my colleagues, to try to support and even study other alternative ways to support our patients and to deal with the side effects, or we call them toxicities, right? And to help people live on. You know, one of the first things I ever studied was whether people take their drugs or not, right? And that's a reason that people come off and we try to prevent that because if you don't stay on it, it's not gonna help prevent the cancer from coming back on some proportion of patients. Right. And so it's a big deal and people do respect that it's a big deal. Um, it's just kind of, if a person, it's a little bit of the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And so I do, anybody listening who's a survivor, who's on all this stuff, definitely talk to your doctor. There are resources. You can go to breastcancer.org. You can go to you know the Dana-Farber website and survivorship. You can go to a lot of places and find a lot of information on what helps um, a lot of the side effects from uh, breast cancer medicines. Um, uh, but, uh, we're, we're having a weird kind of internet thing. I can totally hear you, but you're kind of in slow motion, but it's not affecting this really important information, And So we're gonna just do a couple more questions then I'm gonna let you go. But somebody said, other than a lump, are there other symptoms I should be aware of that my body could experience if I have breast cancer? I thought that's a really interesting question that I've never really thought about. Yeah, so, so lumps are what we always think about. And the majority of when they present with a lump, obviously, and, you know, who's not someone who's not being screened or between a screen, um, that is the way that the majority of cancers present. Um, especially in young patients, but it can also be a rash, as I alluded to in the inflammatory patients and non-inflammatory, there can be a rash on the skin that doesn't go away. You can have a lump under the arm and then nipple discharge, which especially if it's bloody or brown, that's something to seek medical attention. And then, you know, cancer typically in the breast isn't painful, but if a woman is having increasing pain in her breast, I say get that evaluated too, because sometimes it is painful. And you can't say it's never painful. And so lumps, bumps, nipple discharge, skin changes or puckering or rash, lumps under the arm or pain that's kind of not going away. Those, those are all things I'd get evaluated. One thing I, I know people are asking about estrogen replacement therapy. I was on the patch and then I took progesterone in pill form so I didn't have unopposed estrogen, which I think can increase your risk of, uh, I believe, uterine, uterine cancer. Endometrial. Yeah. Yep. Right. And Okay. So anyway, I loved it, quite frankly. Um, I loved my estrogen. I miss my estrogen. How do you feel about women, postmenopausal women or perimenopausal women taking estrogen if they have no history of breast cancer in their family. And of course the Women's Health Initiative and um, all that really screwed that up. And, and the coverage of that study really screwed things up for women and gave them this false fear that estrogen replacement therapy, they, they'd get breast cancer. So what do you think about that? <laughs> so. So there is a slight increased risk with hormone replacement therapy when it's estrogen and progesterone combined of getting breast cancer. On the flip side, many women do need it and they need it for symptom management. And we do it at low doses and um, we eventually try and get people off of it over time. And the vast majority of women won't get breast cancer. And so the way that I would recommend people manage is, it depends a little bit on how miserable one is from menopause and whether you need it for symptom management. And if you're just having a few hot flashes and you can take care of the vaginal dryness with some lubrication and moisturizers, then I wouldn't take an extra medicine. If your quality of life or sleep or things are suffering, then typically I would say, maybe it's worth going on some hormone replacement for a period of time. It's a, it's a weighing of the pros and cons. But you're I right, did it. 
hysteria about it. Before that, there was a lot of, it was bad if you didn't put someone on hormone replacement therapy because we thought it prevented heart disease. That's what Women's Health Initiative told us. It didn't prevent heart disease, unfortunately, and it was associated with a small increased risk of breast cancer. So for the most part, the pendulum swung dramatically the other direction for many women. I took it for brain fog. I mean, I took it sort of probably for va vanity reasons, like keeping your skin not so dry because I have like really dry skin and brain fog and joint pain. And, you know, I just, I just felt better when I did it. I mean, I did. And so I, do you think that taking that or being on hormone replacement therapy might have caused my breast cancer? I, we can never say in any given individual what, you know, what caused their breast cancer. What we can say is there is a slight increased risk. But, you know, there are plenty of people who are taking hormone replacement therapy who don't get breast cancer. And yeah. so I, individual, I think it's usually a constellation of factors. Um, and I, you know, I always tell patients, you make the best decision with the information you have in the moment and what feels like the right thing to do and move forward. And we're always kind of, there's always pros and cons to what we're putting in our bodies and what, how we're living our lives, right? And you can't, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. but would you do anything differently if it helped you for 10 years? You know, even if it did slightly increase it or I don't know how long, you know? Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Do you have a program for young women who find out they are BRCA positive? I guess the question is, where do you go for genetic testing? And then where do you go if, in fact, you do test positive, not only for BRCA, but for other genetic mutations? Yeah. So, so you go to your doctor to talk about it. And some primary care doctors are comfortable doing the genetic counseling and testing and, and referring. They should know where they are. Some are not. And therefore, you know, we're gynecologists. And so you can go to one of the big centers. So a lot of the big centers have cancer risk and prevention groups. We have one at Dana-Farber. They're in LA. They're in New York. They're in Chicago. Um, some smaller centers will have them as well. And you can go and get tested there. Um, and then if someone does have a genetic predisposition, often they'll be followed by those same groups um, or they can be followed by their primary, but definitely you want to have the right information about how to be followed because then you're going to have more intensive cancer surveillance and potential and options for reduction of risk for reducing and, the chances. And you have this whole uh, program for young women, don't you? Can you just <laughs> tell us quickly about that in case sure. anyone wants to check it out? Thank you. So we, we focus on young women who are diagnosed with breast cancer and, you know, 10 to 15% of them will have a clear hereditary predisposition. If we go into those, you know, less common genes, it goes up to 25%. But once they've had the cancer, they also have to think about not only how we treat the cancer, but what we do about their other risks if they have that genetic predisposition, number one. Number two is when young women are diagnosed, they have a lot of other stuff they have to worry about. They haven't necessarily started their families, let alone completed them. They're building their careers. They are dealing with, you know, new relationships. Not some, you know, unique to young age, but definitely more common in younger patients. And the fertility thing is huge and the genetic thing is more common. And so our program is about supporting them and the whole person through and beyond their breast cancer. And at the same time, doing research to better understand both what they need and what's going on for wh why they got it and what we can do to make it better from both a disease and an emotional standpoint. And how do people, can anyone be involved in that or do they have to be your patients at Dana-Farber? Yeah. So, so they're automatically enrolled if they're our patient at Dana-Farber, but we actually have an external website that anybody can go to. It's called Young and Strong. So if you Google Dana-Farber and Young and Strong, you can you'll find our website. And that has a lot of information about managing a lot of side effects. It's got, you know, sexual health information. It's got, you know, dealing with genetics information. It's got fertility information for our young patients, being young and, you know, having a brat, no breasts, things like that. So well, hopefully that's it's where we, that's, that, that is great information. I mean, I could talk to you all night. My husband won't like that, but, um, you know, I think it's super important that we give people that, you know, information that they can trust and, you know, um, thank you for actually just spending part of your Sunday night before 
the Jets Chiefs game because everybody's going to watch it because of Taylor Swift. But thank you for for all this information. And I do hope that that some of these people studying environmental factors may be able to shed some light because I don't know. It just doesn't. It seems like some of these chemicals, whether we're talking about PFAs or forever chemicals and some of the other things that we're exposing our bodies to on a regular basis um, may be harmful to our health. And it would be nice if, if science, you know, if, if it was studied completely and it could be ruled out, but definitely, you know, uh, be considered part of the problem if that's the case. That's right. I totally agree. And I hope that, you know, I, I know that the schools of public health and different environmental scientists are looking at things like this. And they have found things, right? We know about connections of kidney cancer and certain toxic wastes. So in leukemia and certain toxic wastes. So I, I do think that if, if we, you know, when we are looking into plastics and phytoestrogens and estrogen, you know, the, I forget what the estrogens are called, but get, they're, they're estrogen blockers, right? Or they're something, they do something bad to estrogen for women. Yeah. But know exactly what it is um, but I don't think we figured out exactly what's out there that's hurting us but I think there is you know maybe there is and we'll figure it out I hope so well Ann Partridge again thanks so much for your time thanks for watching everyone we hope it if if you think this was helpful let me know in the comments because I'll do more of them if it's not helpful we don't have to waste everybody's time but hopefully you got some important information that can give you some guidance on on staying healthy. And so nice to meet you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for having me. Take care. Okay. Go Bye, everybody.